Say I wanted to know how long it takes a baker to make a batch of cookies. So we start with, say, some ingredients. Let's call those ING. And we want to know how long it takes for the baker to convert those ingredients into cookies. And there's some rate constant, let's say, associated with this process, some K value. There are two ways we could think about doing this, the flash photolysis way and the TCSPC way, as we'll see here in a second. The flash photolysis way, which we're familiar with already, would be to take a million bakers, put them all in a room, and have them make cookies, and follow the appearance of cookies, or the disappearance of the ingredients, over time as those million bakers make their cookies. This is akin to what we do in flash photolysis experiments, where we generate a very large concentration of excited state molecules and follow what they do over time. But there's another way we could think about doing this. And it's more convenient in this particular metaphorical example. Getting our hands on a million bakers and, and watching them make cookies is pretty much impossible, right? And sometimes generating an excited state in that hive concentration is impossible. For example, due to problematic interactions between excited state molecules at high concentration. Or maybe we don't have the time resolution to measure our process of interest. Maybe cookies are coming in so fast from these million bakers that we can't keep track of what's going on. An alternative approach would be to have one baker. And to say to that one baker, all right, I'm going to have you make cookies a million times under normal circumstances, right? So people are coming in and out of your store. You might get distracted. You might have other things, you know, other business related things come up. But I'm going to ask you to make cookies a million times and measure how long it takes to make each batch and then generate a histogram of the frequency of each measured time, how often it takes you each amount of time to generate cookies. This is the spirit of what's called time-correlated single photon counting experiments, or TCSPC. And the single photon gets at this idea of one baker. We essentially use one photon to maybe excite the sample. As we'll see, many cycles do not result in photo excitation, and that's necessary to make sure the experiment works. But when we do excite the sample, one molecule gets photo excited, and then we measure the emission of a single photon at some later time point, essentially indicating that, say, the fluorescence process is complete. We've made a batch of cookies, if you will. We measure that time delay between excitation and emission, repeat that millions and millions and millions of times, and generate this histogram of the times to emission, showing the frequency of the times to emission. And amazingly, amazingly to me, this produces kinetic data that is equivalent to the time series data that we saw in the last video generated via flash photolysis fundamentally because of the quantum probabilistic nature of the emission process. So in this video, we'll dig a little bit more into the TCSPC experiment, look at a typical instrument, and some of the quirks of this experiment that we need to watch out for, given that we're doing a repeated process at very short time scale and watching for emission of photons. The essential goal of a TCSPC experiment is to get kinetic data, just like flash photolysis, for an emission process, such as fluorescence. And the idea here is that we measure the time delay between excitation initiated by an excitation pulse and emission as measured by a fluorescence detector at right angles to the sample. And we repeat this millions and millions of millions of times to take advantage of statistics and the law of large numbers. And the data we get is a histogram of the times between excitation and emission. So following, for example, the light situation as a function of time, TCSPC data looks like this. A laser pulse hits the sample, may excite it or may not, and we start a timer. When a fluorescence photon is detected, we stop that timer. And of course, the computer handles all this, right, in connection to the detectors. And we repeat that cycle over and over and over again. Many cycles, in fact, the vast majority of cycles, to ensure that our data is high quality, result in no emission at all. So we, we hit the sample with a laser pulse. Maybe it was excited, maybe it wasn't, but we observed no emission at all. We then take all those measured start-stop times and put them on a histogram with all the possible times on the x-axis and the counts or frequency of that time to emission being observed on the y-axis. When we do this and we look at the tops of each pile of counts, miraculously we get what is essentially kinetic data. 
we get a fit that says that the number of counts is proportional to, let's say proportional to, e to the negative kt, an exponential decay process, where k is the rate constant for fluorescence. So this is an approach for measuring the rate constant of fluorescence using not a large concentration of excited state molecules, but a single excitation event in each cycle, and repeating the cycle millions and millions and millions of times. Of course, this function, e to the negative kt, extends out to infinity and never quite reaches zero. So there is some non-zero probability that fluorescence emission will take a very, very long time relative to the excitation event. We want to avoid too much overlapping between the cycles. Overlapping would create artifacts in the data at low time points. Imagine that this photon, for example, wasn't emitted until somewhere in the second cycle. If that happened, we would observe an excitation emission time difference like this. And of course, this point is completely artificial. That photon is actually associated with the prior cycle, but we'd have no way of knowing that given the data, right? And this leads to what's called pile up, which is a problematic issue with these experiments. We want to avoid this so that each photon that is emitted is found within its corresponding excitation cycle. In order to achieve this, we actually need many, many cycles where no emission takes place at all. This gives us great confidence that photons that are emitted do so within the corresponding excitation cycle. And so an excitation event and an emitted photon are connected to one another with nothing happening between the two events. And so typically less than 5% of cycles actually produce emission. And we design the frequency and intensity of our laser pulse in order to achieve this. I like to refer to the TCSPC experiment as the racing photons because in essence what we're doing is we are timing the molecule in its race to fluoresce. And we do that repeatedly and get a histogram of the times. Think back to the baker analogy. This is akin to timing a baker as he makes cookies a million times probably not the same time distribution we would get in that case, so the analogy breaks down to some extent there, but it gives you the spirit of the TCSPC experiment. And we'll come back to this question of how a single molecule, right, each of these excitation cycles excites a single molecule because a single photon is impinging on the sample with each laser pulse. How does a single molecule know to exhibit this exponential decay profile for emission? The short answer is quantum weirdness, and we'll have a little bit more to say about that here in a second. First, let's dig into the analytical chemistry and the instrument design for a TCSPC experiment in a little more detail. So we've seen what the basic data looks like. How do we achieve the collection of that data? Well, I want to start you off here at the computer and note that the computer is connected both to the pump pulse laser driver. This laser is our pump source. This is the source of our single photons for excitation of the sample. And at right angles, we have a photomultiplier tube that measures fluorescence. And so this is our probe for fluorescence. At the start of a cycle, the diode laser driver sends a signal back to the computer that says, hey, I've started. At the same time, it sends a signal out to the laser head, hey, shoot out a photon. At that point, the computer begins timing. And this is often a voltage ramp. So it will start at zero volts and slowly move up, slowly increase the voltage with time in some way that is known to us, typically in a linear way. And at some point in the future, a photon is emitted by the sample. That photon passes through a cutoff filter. This avoids scattering issues of the incident light and other emissions that may not be directly relevant to fluorescence. And that photon is detected at the photomultiplier tube. At that instant, we get a signal back to the computer that says, all right, turn off your stopwatch and record the time that has elapsed. And what actually happens is that voltage ramp is stopped and then a time to amplitude converter converts the voltage signal into a time. An analog to digital converter puts that time in digital form. And then a histogrammer essentially plots that time, adds that time to our running histogram of times to emission. To ensure the precise measurement of times, we make use of this constant fraction discriminator, or CFD, and the level trigger. And the idea here is that the PMT will give somewhat different responses 
for each photon that hits because of slight variations in how the fluorescence process takes place and how the photomultiplier tube detects a photon impinging on it. And so we, we essentially use a cutoff level to detect that a photon has been emitted in the case of the CFD and in the case of the level trigger that an excitation photon has been sent to the sample via the laser. When that level trigger hits, that's our start symbol, our indicator to start the stopwatch. And when the CFD hits, that's our stop signal, since the photomultiplier tube is now giving us a signal and CFD tells us, yes, that's a real signal, stop your stopwatch. So I won't go into this in more detail. The one thing I will say is that this article at the link is a fantastic introduction to TCSPC, both in the design of the experiment and the instrumentation and some advanced applications. So if you want to know more about how the instrument is actually designed, check out this article from PicoQuant. Finally, let's, let's talk briefly about the data analysis. And truth be told, this is not that different from flash photolysis. We can still model this decay in green using an exponential decay function. So something like n as a function of t, the number of counts as a function of time is e to the negative t divided by tau or e to the negative kt. And from that, we can measure the lifetime and one over the lifetime, which is the rate constant for the fluorescence process. We may want to watch out for multi-exponential fits here in case multiple decay processes are causing the fluorescence to decrease over time. And we may want to watch out for what's going on at very, very short times when the excitation pulse is still hitting the sample. We do still have a region, and you can barely see it right here, where the excited state concentration appears to be increasing on the green signal as a result of the excitation pulse coming in there. So we may need to include in our fit some information about the excitation pulse as well as some corrections due to potential pile up, if that's an issue at early time points to ensure that our rate constant and lifetime are actually measured accurately. The last thing that I'll touch on is this interesting question of, in a TCSPC experiment, in any given cycle, only one molecule is photoexcited. We don't have to do TS TCSPC on single molecules, but in a given cycle, it's extremely common that only one molecule is photoexcited. How in the world does that molecule know or understand that it is su supposed to, quote unquote, follow an exponential decay profile. Put another way, how does that one molecule understand that the fluorescence process is supposed to follow first order behavior when that first order behavior seems to depend on the concentration of the excited state? The answer more or less, and the answer I'm going to give in this brief discussion in this video is to recall the relationship that we developed earlier in the course between probability and rate. We looked at this in the context of Fermi's golden rule and the idea that the more likely a quantum process is to take place, the faster its rate. That idea extends down to the level of a single molecule, a single excited state. As a quantum entity, the molecule and the associated transition, the fluorescence transition, are associated with some probability distribution over time. And so the very quantum nature of the transition basically enforces this time distribution. And so at each time point, the molecule is essentially rolling dice, right? And let's say when it hits snake eyes, it emits a photon. Most molecules will hit snake eyes relatively early in that process, say 10, 15 nanoseconds. Some will take much longer to do so just due to the laws of chance, 35, 30 nanoseconds. After a very large number of those dice rolling experiments, we get a distribution or a histogram of the number of times or the amount of time it takes to hit snake eyes that looks like this. It all comes down to quantum probability. 